and welcome to the podcast. Thomas Janan is a slopestyle athlete from Belgium. He broke onto the scene winning the Red Bull Joyride at Crankworks. It amazes me how he can be joking around throwing sticks at you and then two seconds later be perfectly completing a cash roll, the final shot of a film. Do you keep the tree can now? No. What are you doing? Three tea bog, I think. Hmm. Then I'm doing a tree tape. To have a good day, it's better to start with a tree tape. Why? It's been insane. Oh, that's so weird. Welcome to the Until Sunset podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Osborne. Join us on location with the world's best writers and the Antiel Films crew to explore the moments we capture from sunrise to sunset. Oh, this is nice. Let me know when you're ready. Fun though, fast. Fast. AR dog. Anytime. I mean, it's Sunday. That was awesome. <laughs> There's something addicting about a mountain bike. Yeah. Oh! Yeah. That's the best. This was an interview recorded on location during the filming of the Hawaii segment of the film Return to Earth. We are late now into the one month shoot. Most of the riders have arrived and have spent some time up on the hill above the camp location testing the line. Go! The closing segment comprises of one smooth run down the mountainside, starting with Brett Reader and Reed Boggs from where they left off in the intro segment. Brett and Reed ride their line and meet Casey Brown and Ryan Howell, and then pass it on to Thomas Shannon and Emilio Johansson. Get on! The Loaf Day crew have done an amazing job for Tommy G and Emil, sculpting some big sets into a ridge on the mountainside of the Hawaiian landscape. Through the dense green plantation, you can see artworks of red sand punching through. The first time I saw these jumps for the two slope style athletes, I couldn't wait to find out what they were going to do with them on their bikes. Emil, send it. Word. And of course they didn't disappoint. Here's Matt Hunter standing watching them as he talks about how Tommy pulls off a tight landing as he fully puts these jumps through their paces. You can hear it's Tommy by his loud Industry 9 hub, almost the loudest from everyone in Hawaii. And you can hear he's on his slope style bike from the hard packed dirt that he's riding and he's hitting them at speed. Tommy G did a spinning trick and landed like along the left edge of that landing beside the road, the first jump. Oh yeah. Just like shazha and all this dirt like flew off the side of the landing. Like he even wizarded it. Like he is so lucky, man. It was quite something to see all the riders watching each other and really just enjoying themselves out in this landscape. It's cool just to disconnect from so many different distractions and everyone just get out and ride their bikes. And you can really see this in the segment. So there's a bit of spare time during the middle of the day and I get to find out how Tommy G has been enjoying Hawaii. So Tommy, we take a little break from riding during the day here. What do you think of the camp setup we got? Well, the camp is cool, um, super crowded. I kind of feel like, well, I feel more in Hawaii here than close to the beach. I don't know why. It's super green and wild animals and it's just the crew and the riders. It's, I think it's a good time having dinner and uh, just cruising at the camp. Yeah, other than mountain biking, what are you being getting up to here? Not much. I think I came uh, right at the time we started shooting. So uh, the other guys went surfing and doing a bunch of other stuff. But uh, I went to the beach, went to the skate park and pretty much, uh, yeah, road bikes and that's it so yesterday we got to go over and check out pipeline what were your thoughts on checking out such an iconic surf location oh yeah what did you think the, i watched video videos of uh, like the big waves and stuff but when you get to see it in real like the waves seems to be like five times bigger you're like wow and uh, i think it was the first time for me to just get in the water when a few waves uh, went there the, the first day and just with like small one I already felt like I was gonna die sometime so uh, when you get to see like super tall waves it's impressive 
And did you give this surfing a try? Did you go for a little paddle out, maybe somewhere with smaller waves? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to say hopefully later this week, but we see if the other guys force me to. <laughs> <laughs> One of the ideas that we're driving with the film is living in the moment. People often talk about how being on a surfboard or on a snowboard or on a mountain bike can push you into a flow state where everything almost slows down. What's your experience yeah, with this? I think that's the the best feeling I know. Sometimes it happens in contests. As soon as you drop in, you know what you got to do, and you almost have that feeling that you know you, you're you going to land everything. Or even if you're at home riding, riding a trail that you know, and you have that feeling that this, you're not going to crash, you're not going to get hurt, you're just going to rip the trail and have fun. Yeah, for, sh for sure. Is there anything else other than mountain biking that you get that experience from? Oh, I just ride mountain bikes, so I guess, uh, I guess, yeah. I, I had that when I was snowboarding a few years back, but I think it's when you're really into something that you like. Yeah, for me, it's mostly mountain biking or having sex with my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so when you're in that moment, we'll say mountain biking, say a competition, how do you deal with that stress that comes along with it? Because there must be a lot on you for the competitions when everyone's looking at you, waiting for you to perform. I like the feeling of just uh, working for something and then and then make it work just in a one day just it's it's right now it's not in 15 minutes it's not uh i don't know i feel like it it can uh, like shape the person i am now and uh the direction my life is is taking and would always take even with or without mountain biking i like just to be focused on things and not like split on so many things and be well i think Competing kind of shaped uh, the person I am now. I'm not sure exactly why, because none of my parents are like that, or like all my friends. Or I think it's just me who who like the feeling of uh, being died on my bike and make it work whenever I want. Like sometime I had like the worst practice ever, but at the time of the the run, everything works and. That way I can feel, I don't know, sometimes you feel like you can make it work whenever you want. That's, I think, a good feeling. Yeah, you, you said there how you don't like to focus on a whole load of things. Yeah. You rather just focus on the one thing, even in your outside life. Well, it's just two kind of person, like the person who would focus on just one thing and try to make the best of it, and some people that are good at, like, everything but i'm the other kind of person that uh, i like to just know that i put all my energy in that thing that i don't have anything to regret or yeah no regrets well i think not saying that the way i see it is the best way to see it because uh good and bad because as i only ride bikes of course i'm like this is a lot of st stuff that i probably would love to do but i'm not even trying but I'm not really sad about it because, I don't know, I just know that my priority is riding bikes. That's what I really like. And uh, it might change with the time, but right now uh, I feel like riding bikes is, it cannot be bad for me because it's my job, my passion. And Yeah, and you talked about putting all that work into mountain biking. How does that feel when that all comes together hmm. and that pays off? Well, um, it's hard to say because um, it's like you can be like crashing at every contest and then go back home and still have fun riding. But I feel like when you land your run, you, you're really proud of it the work the work you did like like yesterday Brett asked me what is your what was your best uh, slope tag result 
when I'm thinking about it, I think if I have to to sell myself to someone, uh, I'm gonna say uh, like winning Crank Cross or winning the overall FMB or I don't know like podium there. But um, I think the one I'm the most proud of is um, last year Rotorua second place because. Um, in 2017, I got hurt and was just a year without without having that feeling of um, of, of a success. But it just success can be just you know for me a fifth place can be successful and a second place can be unsuccessful. It's like it just for me. It's not like really to say like hey I won that I beat that guy or it's just like. I knew that in Rotorua 2018, it was after a year of just crashing and getting injured. And I was kind of in the mind, mindset that I felt like I was not going to do it anymore, but I still try my best anyway. And I did nothing else than training slope style in the all winter because I know that if I'm not giving a chance to that, if I'm doing something else, then... Uh, I'm gonna regret it. So, um. so Thomas is talking about his second place run in Rotorua in 2018. He personally ranks this higher than his first place run at Whistler in Red Bull Joyride, which he won in 2012 when he first came onto the scene as a slope style athlete. He took everyone by surprise as he introduced himself to the world stage. Jump to 2017, and Thomas breaks his ankle early in the season. Oh. And it's this comeback as he rebuilds his strength to placing second in Rotorua that sets aside this run for him. Before he drops in for a second run at Rotorua, he's sitting in fifth place, and you can see his excitement dropping in, pumping himself up. Thomas drops in with an opposite 360 one-footed Tail whips the shark fin, then a big thump flip. Chemical points out that he's the only rider doing 360 tuck no-handers off the flat drops. Thomas ends with a big truck driver to a tail whip. So a 360 bar spin, and as he starts to come back round out of his 360, he throws in a tail whip. He lands both feet on the pedals, but his right foot slides off as he compresses the landing. You can see in his eyes how much he's enjoyed this run, and so much energy that he has even after his run, he rides the berm like a little quarter pipe and foot jams the top of it. Back into the interview now, and Thomas is talking about how he achieved the second place by not throwing a big trick and hoping to land it, but instead by riding his normal style on his slope bike, coming back from injury. I regret it, so, um, so I haven't really rode much down here. Or I just rebuilt my old backyard to look like a slope side course and just rode bikes and did absolutely, absolutely nothing else. And um, I show up in Rotorua and I get second with just my my riding. It wasn't even like I sent the insane big trick and by, by luck I landed and finished second. It was just like my overall riding that I did all winter long that paid off. And for me, this, this was successful. And right after that, I was feeling good on my bike, but got hurt again. And... Uh, my mindset wasn't really at the right uh, place to compete, I think, and kind of messed up like half of the season, crashing at two crank cars. And I had that feeling that um, I wasn't going to do it again this year or got hurt too much. And then in wrestler, I, I think I landed like two perfect runs to me. Like the first one was like maybe my 50% riding of what I was doing back home and got me fifth and then my second run I really like I think rode like 85 person and landed everything perfect and I was really proud of what I did I expected a better ranking but at the end I finished fifth I was a bit disappointed but then I think one week after I just started thinking of it uh, I realized that I wasn't doing it for like judges or for like other people and my writing is different than other people writing so um, I was just happy on my true runs without thinking and I think that that is pretty cool because in competing you, you can always find someone who's gonna beat you but um, 
if I can just be happy with the work I put into what I'm doing and uh, the result I'm having, not like the result in place, but like then I think in in my life it would be much easier than just like having to really compare myself to always like, oh, today I was first, but probably tomorrow I might be like third place or I don't know. But like this could be more stressful. Yeah, it's cool to see, hear you talk about focusing on imp- self-improvements like that. You can see that as well with your the tricks and the way you ride. You can you hear someone talking about something they've just seen you do and they're all like stoked on watching you do a super seat or something like, oh, wow, look, that's that's so cool. Look at this. And then if we talk to you about it, you're like, oh, it could be better. <laughs> do you feel like you're always constantly improving your tricks, your style? or? Yeah, I feel like in the last few years, my riding took a direction. Obviously, I really like competing slope style and it's... Um, it's always cool to finish like first or podium or whatever, but um, at some point I really want my riding to just fit to myself and not really fit to like to what people really expect. Like probably people expect like a, a flip with a few tail whips and a few bar spin, which I sometimes likes. But if that day I feel like learning a super seater, then I just learn it even if I know it's never gonna pay in contest but that's probably the way just I don't know if I if one day I win a slope style with my my run with like really different tricks than the other guys I think it will be much more rewarding to me than I don't know it's just not about just winning it's just about like how you did it yeah, and to perform as a slope style rider, you have to have such a large repertoire of tricks. What's that like learning so many different tricks and getting them all dialed to a level where you can use them in a competition? I like, well, I remember when I was younger, I was getting so mad when I couldn't learn what I was trying. Like, I remember trying to learn tail whips at like 13. It took me a year, like, Maybe 25 try four times a week when you're 13, 13 year old, you end up crying because you can't do it. But now I really like all the process of learning. Like I'm almost almost don't get mad when I'm when I'm failing when I'm trying. I just really like to understand how to make that trick. Like. Well, it could be for casual. Casual is kind of like a wide trick that no one can really explain like you ask and somebody's gonna tell you all oh, right you have to to do front flip turn your head and but then i was like okay this trick no one understand it i'm gonna try to understand it and then uh just the, the whole process to like you failing failing but when you're failing you you can see like okay i failed that i'm gonna change this and then you fail again but a different way and just Understanding how how to make it work, I like that a lot more now than uh, than what I used to to like it. I think I, I used to just like learn the trick. Like I would love to just try it, and then it works. No like uh, no process into that. But now I I like the old thing. I like failing uh, a thousand times before before landing the trick. You talk about their learning tricks uh, when you're younger. At what point did you realize or decide that this was going to be something that you wanted to follow as a career? It's hard to say. I, can, I think it kind of came like step by step. But I remember like I started riding on two wheels at like three year old. I think I could my dad told me that I probably could do it way before, but I was just like happy on my three wheels, and um, he bring me to a three-hour motocross uh, competition. I watched the guy and I asked my dad, "Why does he not on three wheels?" And he said, uh, "Well, the real the the real riders ride on uh, two wheels." And I was like, "Wow, okay." Then 
that they went back home and learned how to ride two wheels. And uh, it works first try. So <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, maybe just myself again, who likes to be just doing the same thing always. But um, well, and then after that, just riding, riding and riding, I don't know. Like, I was kidding, I was just riding bikes. I don't know why, but I like it riding bikes. But I also remember, I understood that if I wanted to ride bikes every day in my life, I needed that as my job because you, well, people tell you that if you want to leave, you need a job. So, um, I don't know, as a kid, I was like, okay, but uh, I want to ride bikes every day. So I was watching my parents going to work at eight and coming back and it was dark and that's it. And uh, so I was like, okay, so if I want to ride bikes every day, then it has to be my job. But the problem that 15 years ago in Europe, mountain bike, you're not making a job out of it. So it was a bit complicated. But then a few years after, like 10 years after, you could see like contests and like all the American guys like making a living of riding bikes. I don't think I have a dream of making a lot of money out of mountain biking. I think I just wanted to be able to ride every day. And I think that's step by step that kind of stuck in my head that I had to be good at riding if I wanted to ride every day. Yeah, so to bring it back to where we are now and the shoot that we're on here in Hawaii, viewer segment, it's yourself and Emilio Hansen. What's that been like for you, you two guys working together on your little section of the final run? Can you talk about that a bit for us? Well, I know that we look the same, like tall, white guys on a slopestyle bike with bare helmet painted Red Bull, dressed in black with dark bikes, and uh, we do bar spin, spin and tail whips, but I think we really try to have uh, well, it was only three jumps, and we tried to have different kind of uh, tricks, which are kind of hard because we both compete in the same contest. And we are both in the middle of the winter and practice time before the next contest. So we should be doing almost a similar, like a similar kind of trick, but we cannot try to have like really different things that way. That's why Emil went for like a in tape to double bar instead of like any kind of like spin or like flips, and um, that's why we choose a good looking trick instead of like the hardest things. And Emil still uh, track downside the last jump, and well, I think the contrast between a track downside and just the, like the oldest tricks ever, the Superman Silver. I think that's that's pretty cool. It's like just an extension trick that would never get paid well in contest compared to like the newest trick, a trick to downside tail whip, which you can only see a few guys doing at the moment. Yeah, that's cool. I like that you're so aware on yeah. what's needed from a filming aspect as well. Yeah. In that you want to go for something that looks visually good. Were you going for something that looked cooler than a meal? I don't know what what is cool. It's really subjective. Like uh, someone would say, "Why are you doing a Superman cigarette next to a 360 with a bar spin and a switch whip?" Let's just pause this right here. This is an interesting thing that Tommy points out. There's a lot happening during the final Hawaii segment of Return to Earth. Brett Reader and Reed Boggs have just ripped down from the top of the mountain while Darcy Wittenberg is racing next to them on the Suron, an electric motorbike. Beauty! Darcy has a full camera rig attached to his back and is transmitting the picture to a side-by-side 4x4, which Fraser Newton is rallying down the mountainside. <laughs> Trying to stay within reach of Darcy on the electric bike. Okay, drop. Down a rugged mountainside. On board the side-by-side -side that Fraser's driving, is cameraman Darren McCullough, who is using a free fly system to control the camera on Darcy's back. And Colin Jones is there to direct them and coordinate this crazy setup. Okay, Darcy, we are in point A and we have 
of Zed and, and Movi, um, but we're just tweaking one or two things here. Next, Reader and Boggs meet up with Ryan Howard and Casey Brown, who now take over. <laughs> Again, all on one continual shot. Ardog and Casey now shred some berms and race down the Hawaii landscape on their downhill bikes. Good luck to the film crew to keep up with that. Amongst all of this one take, the next riders are waiting down the hill for a high speed pass of the baton. Scott Jewett is on radio to try and keep everyone updated on critical moments. Ardog and Casey now pass it on to the slope style guys. Emilio Hansen and Thomas Chenot. These two now have to nail their tricks and look good and think about how they need to line up and pass on to the next riders, Matt Hunter and Carson Stewart. Oh, no. And if Emil or Tommy G don't nail it, it's cut and reset for everyone back to the top. And still Tommy G knows exactly what he and Emil were doing. I had to watch back to check and he was right. Someone would say, why are you doing a Superman seat grab next to a 360 with a bar spin and a switch whip? So he's talking about what Emil is doing in front of him. And here is what Emil is doing. You can hear Emil leave the jump and immediately throw in a bar spin as he leaves the jump. Then you can slightly hear him kick the tail whip through. But more so, you can hear his feet landing on the pedals just before he lands. So here's the full sound of it one more time. I think that shows the communication between these two riders and how well they work together for their segment. They've really talked about what they want to do and amongst all of those crazy things happening at once, Tommy G still knows what Emil's doing. So back into the interview, and Tommy's answering the question I asked him about whose trick looked cooler. I don't know what is cooler. Like, I could have known a track to whip and Emil Superman say grab. I think both tricks are cool. Well, to me, but uh, I actually learned a uh, track to whip way before I learned Superman say grab. So I just felt like doing a Superman say grab. <laughs> and Emil, uh, Emil likes the tricks, but I don't know. And who do you think had more fun out of everyone? It's hard to say with Emil because a track downside for him is not the same thing. Same thing for for the other guys. He do, does it so easy, so he might had a. He was maybe more relaxed on his track downside than me on my Superman Zip drive. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. You guys got paired up for the segment here, and then and you still just worked so well together. You guys clearly have a good relationship. Oh, Emil? Yeah. Wow, super cool. Yeah. Yeah, super cool. Wow, he's how old is Emil? Twenty? He's young. I mean, I'm young too, but uh, can't really ask so much from someone who is twenty. You know, it's like. He just started in mountain biking, so and I feel like he already knows a lot. And he's a nice guy. I mean, I don't have any problems with him, as I don't have any problems with anyone here. Yeah. No, Maybe at the end of the week, <laughs> might start fighting Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> and did you guys talk about the tricks you wanted to do together before? It seems like you you were really on it with what. What did you guys were doing? Yeah, we actually we changed like every runs. Like the day of the shooting, we changed everything. Like five runs before we started shooting, like the first day, then we it got too late. Um, I had a complete different run. I was doing super seater on the first jump, but on the shoot I did it on the last one. I had no trick on the last jump. Uh, I mean, I think I was going to track to whip the last jump and Emil track downside. And then I, I decided to change everything last minute, as always. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and Emil changed his track like a thousand times too. He said a double track to in tape on the last jump and then track downside and then, oh, maybe three tape. No, okay. I stay on the track downside. I, I don't know. I change like a thousand times because we know it's not a contest run. So if people want to see contest tricks, then they can just watch the replay of Forte Rear. They don't need to watch Return to Heart. So I think it makes sense to do different stuff. 
Does it compare at all something like this we're filming and there's so many writers that need to time themselves together along with the filmers? Does that sort of writing pressure compare at all to maybe a competition in any way? Like in the way we we are writing? Could be the way you're writing or maybe the way you prepare before. Mm, no, but it is not less, less uh, pressure on yourself because... It's like in one shot, which is, I think, super complicated for, I mean, especially for you guys. But um, I was thinking that, okay, a contest run, you just need one. You just need to learn one out of two. Of course, they're all your hardest tricks, but here you need to learn it countless of time because it's not only about your writing, it's also about the filming and they're also like it's like a lot of other guys so I would say don't pick a run that you have like just gonna land it once and not want to do it again it's like I pick tricks that I could do over and over tricks that I really like and I think filming fits really well with my writing because it's more stuff that I like making it look good and you make it look good when you have fun and you make it look good when when you do them a lot. So um, I could do these runs like all day long. And I like the tricks. And um, as always, but when when the other guys are showing up and you're about to drop in, you still have that feeling of you need to learn it now. Like you're not overshooting one jump and you're not doing it over and over. You need to learn it now. Or, Maybe if I fucked up once, it's not a big deal, but if I fucked up all day, then I'm fired. <laughs> Us too. <laughs> you do a lot of writing and contests and competing. What are your thoughts on the filming side, working on movies like this? Mm -hmm. What's it like having something like this captured and spending so much time on the visuals and just trying to pull this all together into one solid piece for people to watch. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's the thing. Like uh, a contest, it get it get all. Like if I watch my contest run three years ago, I'm like, well, I wasn't I wasn't bad, but it's nothing compared to now. Or if I watch my uh, winning run at Dry Ride when I was 18, well, it's nothing compared to what you have to do now to win it. But if you watch a video, like when I was injured, I watched videos like the first one I had, like the collective or whatever movie. Uh, you still super stoked on everything they're doing, like the places they went, like the trails they were riding, and what they were doing. Maybe the riding wasn't as impressive as now, but it's still the contrast is still way closer in movies than um, than in contests like contests are great for yourself or like how happy you are after you learn your run or after you win a contest or whatever place you are looking for but the movie you can watch it over and over and still like it before writing if I'm missing motivation and watching a movie not a not a, not one of my contest run from 2010. Yeah. That's me. Yeah, that's cool. Cool, man. Yeah. All right. That's nice. the only thing I have. Yeah. yeah. Go Give digging now. Stuff now. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna open that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah. My name is cool. Oh, awesome. welcome. Thank you very nice. much. Nice. Should I call someone else? Oh, we'll come out. We'll stretch, come out stretch the legs. Oh, fresh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's nice here. Thank you for listening. That was taken from an interview with Thomas Shannon on location in Hawaii for the film Return to Earth. I'm your host, Jonathan Osborne. The interview and questions were also carried out by Matthew Butterworth. For more information, see antiofilms.com or find us on social at antiofilms. Return to Earth is available on most major platforms and is also now available to watch on Amazon Prime. Thanks again. See you next time.